Hello, test takers. Let's get into this reading and writing test question. Henry Osawa Tanner's 1893 painting, The Banjo Lesson, which depicts an elderly man teaching a boy to play the banjo, is regarded as a landmark in the history of works by black artists in the United States. Scholars should be cautious when ascribing political or ideological values to the painting, however. Beliefs and assumptions that are commonly held now may have been unfamiliar to Tanner and his contemporaries, and vice versa. Scholars who forget this fact when discussing the banjo lesson, therefore, blank. Okay, so we have to logically complete the text. That means this is an inference question. We need to fully understand the argument so we can fill in that therefore. I'll break down the argument. The argument can be broken down into two halves, uh, the premises and the conclusion. The premises are the facts. You connect those facts to provide evidence for the conclusion. The conclusion is the central claim of the argument, and it relies on those facts. So in inference questions, there's going to be a gap somewhere. Maybe it's a gap in the premises that would best support a conclusion, or maybe it's a gap where the conclusion might go that a set of premises is pointing towards. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to find what's missing and fill that gap with one of the choices. So in order to do that, I'm going to rephrase what we're looking at as bullet points. So... Tanner's The Banjo Lesson from 1893 is a black American art landmark. Scholars, look out, right? Be cautious when ascribing values to the artwork. Um, Tanner and company are from the past. They may not share our politics. Scholars who forget all of that, therefore, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so it seems to me that we have several premises here that point towards a conclusion. We can't always make precise predictions in inference questions because there are any number of ways that you could go here, but we can gesture at what the argument is. Uh, and I'm going to say that the argument is that it's a mistake to assume that Tanner and artists like him share our present day politics. Scholars should be cautious. So when we go through the choices, I'll be looking carefully for the option that talks about making assumptions about how similar 1893's politics were to the present's politics. I'm just going to call that the past is not the present. Scholars who forget that the past is not the present, therefore, choice A, tend to conflate Tanner's political views with those of his contemporaries. This strays from the argument. We don't know what his politics were or what his contemporary views were, but the argument is that neither Tanner nor his fellow artists of the period knew what our modern politics were. This doesn't connect to the argument we identified. You can cross it off. So, uh, choice B, scholars who forget that the past is not the present, therefore wrongly assume that Tanner's painting was intended as a critique of his fellow artists. Again, bringing in this fellow artists angle, the passage lumps Tanner and his contemporaries into the same category, right? We don't have the information here to know if he was critiquing other artists of his time, and this doesn't connect to the argument set up by the premises, right? It's not comparing our time to his, it's comparing his time to his. Choice C, scholars who forget that the past is not the present, therefore forgo analyzing Tanner's painting in favor of analyzing his political activity. Well, this isn't it either. We're not looking for a conclusion exclusively about the politics of the past. We're looking for a conclusion that wrongly connects the politics of the past to the politics of the present. And that leaves us with choice D, scholars who forget that the past is not the present, therefore risk judging Tanner's painting by standards that may not be historically appropriate. Well, that's on the money, right? That's in line with the argument I identified. It's a mistake to assume that Tanner and artists like him shared our present-day politics. If you forget that, you might judge Tanner's painting by standards that aren't historically appropriate. That's our best, most logical choice. For inference questions, you really have to get inside the argument and test each choice. But there you go. That's how I did it. Good luck out there. You've got this. Hey, hey, test takers, it's question time. Let's see what the future holds, shall we? Lee Bardugo's best-selling novel, Six of Crows, fet, set, set in a fictional world inspired by early modern Europe, follows the story of notorious criminal Kaz Brecker as he musters a team of outlaws and misfits to pull off an impossible heist. Assembling the team is no easy task, and Brecker must navigate the blank, making the process all the more difficult. Which choice completes the text that it conforms to the conventions of standard English? All right, and whenever I see the phrase conventions of standard English, I know that just means 
grammar. This is what we call a form, structure, and sense question. It's testing our knowledge of punctuation, grammar, and syntax. The questions can take many forms, right? So the trick here is identifying which rule the question is testing. And we do that by looking at the answer choices. And looking at the answer choices here, I can see that this is a question about plural possession. Right? You can see that the endings of all of these, these nouns keep changing. Right? Is there an apostrophe? Is there an S? Is there an apostrophe S? Is there an S apostrophe? Um, so let's, let's go back up to the sentence. Um, Kasbrecker is looking to manage the recruits' competing interests. Right? Uh, assembling the team is no easy task, and Brecker must navigate the recruits' competing interests, making the process all the more difficult. Okay, so that's multiple recruits making up a team and the interests belong to them. So that's plural possessive. Recruit with an S followed by an apostrophe. Plural recruits, they own something. What do they own? Interests, plural interests, but nothing belongs to those interests, right? So. Plural with an S, but no apostrophe at the end. Which choice matches these two requirements? Not choice A, right? Not choice B. Plural. Plural possessive. Plural not possessive. That's choice C. Pow, pow. So this is just one example of what a form, structure, and sense question could look like. Fortunately for you, the other videos in this lesson will cover them. All right. Good luck out there. You've got this.